today I'm going to talk about um, how I've taken my journey up and down around career management and how I started making uh, better career decisions. And I'll share my own experience, hopefully it's something that will be interesting for you. Uh, before that, just a bit of background. Um, so actually I'm a computer engineer, uh, I graduated from computer science and I, really, I was really passionate about that and I started working in the company that I dreamed of, um, Nortel, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so when I started working there, I started working like from um, morning 6am to 1am. Um, I was really passionate, uh, I worked on products that were really cutting edge technologies and after six months, I waited to see the outcome of it, and it was like the products failed, no one used the products. Um, really disappointing, especially once you graduate, it's your first job and you worked so hard to get the result of it. But I think it was a really good lesson for me because I learned that actually that's not enough. You have cutting edge technology, using the best tools out there is not really enough. Um, so I started questioning well, how do we decide on what to build or what are the things we need to focus on? How come people don't use these amazing products? Um, I didn't know product management existed at that time, so I started kind of doing this as part of my role, um, kind of 50 50, um, kind of asking what's the problem we need to solve, what do we need to do, and uh, is that the real problem that we're focusing on? Um, after a while, I realized there's a product management uh, position and role that really I'm passionate about. So I moved uh, as a full time to product management and I'm happy I did that. So I worked on different, in different industries from healthcare to uh, uh, banks, fintech, and um, also probably I'm missing some healthcare, um, several different companies so far. And in the last company I took some investments. So I've been also product lead in the last two years and managing a product portfolio with coaching managing product managers. So it's as a another dimension of aligning product portfolio and coaching to manage product managers. I really enjoy uh, product management. So, um, so before I start, I just wanted to uh, see your hands if you're really new to product management or if you're willing to move to product management. So I can be more uh, right, thank you. So I just I will touch on the product management stages. Um, this is one of the examples I give to the product managers I work with and I coach. So I see product managers as playing an instrument. So it's like playing the guitar, I don't know if you like playing an instrument, but you need to learn your chords first. And it's the, for me, it was the most boring stage because you need to practice. In, uh, I went to my instructor when I was learning guitar and I said, I wanted to play these songs. And he said, no, you need to learn your chords first. Um, you really need to practice. You really need to understand. So your chords are like the things that you might have heard or you might be already using agile. Um, methodologies, discoveries, design sprints, um, and lots of other things that you might have heard. And it's not enough because if you don't practice it, then you still don't know it really well. Um, it's not just reading a book or reading or learning your chords, but if you don't know how to play that song, still it's not a really uh, good skill to put in place. However, the ideal state and what I think is like the product management as being really effective is this improvisation bit. Um, when you're improvising in a band, especially, I don't know if you like blues, um, I really like blues jams. When I see these people, as, uh, especially if you like blues jams, there are, there's a really good place called Blues Kitchen. I'm not working there, but it's a really nice place. And uh, what they do is people go with their instruments and then they pick uh, from the list five people get on the stage, they start performing. Um, they never play together in their life, they never uh, play the song, and they don't read from sheets, it's pure improvisation. And what I see product managers like that, it's not always a lead role. You sometimes need to take a step back, you need others to lead. And you need to change and adapt to different team dynamics as well. I think it's really important. So the skill I'm going to talk about today is mainly here. But I think even if you're really new or if you're willing to change uh, your role to product management, I think it's good to kind of keep in mind and maybe um, spend your time in kind of thinking that. I wish I knew before, so it would help me in my journey. I hope it will be helpful. So it sounds super simple, obviously it's not easy, it practice. So uh, this really resonates with me and pro probably in most of the product managers. Uh, once you know the right thing, it's really easy to solve. But one, the knowing the right thing is always a challenge. And I think the anxiety part is that challenge and just tackling that challenge, that's one of the things I love about my profession. So 
how uh, I'll explain how I actually approached um, tackling these challenges in my journey, and I'll, some, I'll share some of my failures as well. So this is what, I, what have been working for me uh, in the last few years, and I used in my products, and I'll give examples as well. So the first thing I do is, if it's a new product, or if it's not a new product, and things change so often sometimes, especially in fintech space, so understanding the business and the strategy is quite key. But it's not enough. So you need to learn your customer, or if it's a new product, understanding your target market is really important as well. So I'll cover these two because they're really, I think, dependent, they go hand in hand. And for those that might remember before product management, everything was business driven and lots of products failed. Uh, and if you don't have the customer embedded in business strategy, then actually uh, you can't really succeed as well. Um, in order for the product to be successful, these two are not enough. So if you know the business strategy, you know why you're playing. Still, you're working with people, and if you have a really bad team, I mean, people might be really nice, but you don't have a team dynamics in place, still the product won't be successful. I haven't seen any uh, products that are successful uh, and they don't have really good teams, or they don't have the uh, motivated teams in place. So I'll touch on the people side as well. And the last one, as I mentioned, is improvisation, so adapting to team dynamics, and that's not really possible if you don't understand people and the motivations. So I'll start with the business and the customer side. Um, so these guys helped me to explain it in a bit of detail, but uh, I'd like to first explain what I mean uh, by when I say product and users. It might be different for everyone. So I really like Robin Pitchler's definition of product. So it's the entity that serves a set of users for specific needs and at business value. And when I say users, it might be internal users or external users, and you might work on APIs or integrations, it might be these as well. So today, all my examples are actually external client-based. Um, the product I'm working on is called Choice, and all the examples I'm going to give are through Choice, I just, I'll just explain really briefly on what it is, so that might make hopefully more sense. Uh, really brief product uh, proposition, so it's a P2P lending platform and the borrowers actually uh, go to Octopus, uh, we have Octopus property, they say we'd like to have this mortgage and can you please borrow us the money, so they actually borrow money from Octopus and they make monthly payments like mortgage. So we also have investors and these investors invest money but they get also returns and interest every month through these payments. So our business model is generally around the borrower's side, it's a free product. Um, our target market the investors are three types. One is the direct investors, so anyone can join and put £10 in and start investing. Or, um, actually Octopus is a really advisor-led business, so advisor at the core of our business. And advisors are also using our product to manage their clients and add clients or through them, uh, their investors, their advice clients also put money in and invest as well. So we have three target markets. Today I'm going to focus on this advisor side. So this is the, uh, so I'm now going through what I've done, it's, it's a real example, I've done it like a few months ago, I think nearly six months ago. <coughs> so for me, uh, from my experience, this was one of the hardest things to understand, like understanding the business strategy. Uh, because when I talk to, I don't know, your experience might be different when I talk to directors or the, even the CEO, uh, so how will the company succeed? The response was generally around, if you increase revenue by X percent, then we will be really successful. So that's actually a result. Um, of course the business will be successful if they make more money. But where do you want to be in, in the state as a strategy is really hard to get. So all this one-liner here, being the first business to come to mind for advice in UK, is our Octopus strategy. It took me uh, maybe like at least talking to 10 people and understanding what the real business strategy is. Uh, this is really important because uh, if you don't know the business really well, then it's really hard to align your product strategy. So I spent a bit of time, especially the first time I was doing it, to clarify that uh, as well. The second thing is, once we identify this business strategy, uh, what's the positive change the product is going to bring? So as I mentioned, Octopus has different products, and these products are like 15-year-old products, Choice is a new product, it's a three-year-old P2P platform, quite different than other tech-saving products. 
Um, so there are differentiators, and one of them uh, was being high tech. So everything I touched on was uh, done automatically, or loans and everything is diversified automatically with no manual intervention. So still, we can be high tech, but as I uh, explained my failure, my first experience, even if, if, it, if it's not advisor friendly, still being the high tech uh, product will not be successful. And um, this part, the advisor friendly side, is not really good at this day. So we thought, being that high tech, and high touch is the part which is, um, even if we give the best product, the digital experience, so this is more the digital product proposition side, um, Advice might call, I mean, they will always call and uh, ask support from our sales teams, our customer and support teams. So we still need to be able to provide information to these teams. So that goes hand in hand. So that's the overall product strategy. So um, I forgot to mention actually that I do this exercise uh, currently quarterly. It depends on your product, it's not a rule of thumb. Uh, when I first joined, the product was a year old. And it was really new, the strategy was changing all the time. So I re revisited these every month because the strategy changed and you need to align everything. But currently, we are being doing quietly. So the objectives are the next one that I went through. So we know the product strategy. So for this quarter, so this is a quarterly one, uh, what are the main objectives? And objectives are really high level, so you can see here. Uh, for us, it's creating a seamless digital experience for our advisors because we know that we are missing lots of things. We have our user research, and our user research suggests that we really need to provide them more information. Um, that we receive feedback from sales, customer team, so we have lots of information to support that. We really have, really have, need to have that as an objective. So, I, for the scope of this today's session, I'm giving only one example, but normally for each product we have two, three objectives per quarter. It's not a rule of thumb, but uh, again, depending on your product, you can set different objectives. So, given this is the objective, so you'd like to create this digital experience, what would be the themes, or to put it differently, what are the pain points of these uh, advisors? So given the advice of kind of we'd like to create this, what would be the opportunity? So from all the user feedback and direct user interviews, we know that the information that they need doesn't exist in the system and the product was built based on some assumptions three years ago. So we started kind of going through it and um, we understood that the information is not really there for them. So they can't really serve their clients. They can't add any uh, clients to the system because of that. It's one of the biggest things, pain points that they have. Um, again, I gave one example, but you can have more than one theme to say to be uh, in line with the same objective. So this is maybe you might be familiar with outcomes. So if we say if we fix this problem, if they can find all the information they need, what would be the positive change? What would be the behavior change, and how can you measure it? How can you say that it's successful? Uh, for this specific theme, uh, what we've done is actually. We already record all the calls and we tag them in customer and sales teams. And when we look at the calls, just for that information, we have lots of support calls. So we said that if we set the KPI to decrease at 20%, then we can say that yes, actually we've succeeded in and we have that behavior change. Uh, in the strategy or roadmap sessions, the, the, these are the things I discuss and I don't do this on my own. I have separate <coughs> sessions and they uh, kind of a stakeholder session uh, monthly and quarterly if needed as well. So I kind of covered here, but I'll add, add, add one more. So I have a separate session about the outcomes, about outputs. Outputs are also known as features, and from my experience, I know that it's really feature-driven. The organizations got used to feature-driven uh, things, so that's one of the reasons why I kind of have the feature-driven sessions in a separate one after having a strategic and roadmap sessions. And um, once we know the outcomes, it's really easy, it's not easy, but it's simple to kind of get to the outputs because you can have sessions around, here are the things we'd like to achieve. Do we have any data? Do we know what we can do about that? And in this example, for example, the, the informative page to explain the performance of the product, we all knew that it was a problem. However, you might be building something new and you might make an assumptions and saying that maybe we can fix this problem by doing this. Uh, in this case, uh, if you don't have any evidence, it might it will be a hypothetical <coughs> assumption. 
So you can test it under different testing methods. So you can do it with mock-ups, you can do surveys. If it's a time to market thing, you can just go with the MVP. Um, so it's another session on its own, but it, you, you can test and experiment it with your hypothesis as well. So this, um, it has additional benefits uh, for me. Actually, I'll share what I mean by that. Um, in the organization, being a product manager, you might need to also create that shared goal and understanding if you're not working in a multidisciplinary team. And it's not really easy if you don't have a shared goal. So this really helped me to clarify what we are doing and why we are doing. Um, and it was really uh, visible, so it's, it, it, it's created the alignment across the organization. And we share, I share all of this stuff, and all the product managers share it in the organization. Slack channels, conference, anyone can see it at any time. Um, visibility is one of the things I really uh, value actually because then uh, you will be able to see the clear goals and the outcomes and anyone including we have remote developers as well so if you ask them I used to ask them to understand whether I'm communicating everything effectively uh, so do you know what you're working on and why are you doing this so when they come up with the outcomes or the objectives that was kind of a uh, short form to say well actually it's I communicated well. This is one of the things that product managers like, actually effective prioritization and communication. Uh, my experience and also the product managers I work with, they have a tendency to say, uh, not yes, but we like helping people. And it's sometimes hard to say no, but in this example, you don't need to say no because, uh, and I'll give an example. Uh, two or three weeks ago, uh, marketing team uh, set a meeting, an hour meeting, and then we went through, here are the things we need to change in the websites. Um, so uh, why are we changing it? And the reason was mainly around um, it's not in the brand, brand guidelines. Okay, so is that in the outcomes or how would that impact the outcomes or the objectives? So I didn't say no to them, but I just asked them what, how can we actually impact that? Um, so they kind of answered saying that, well actually it's not really mapping, but maybe I can have more information and I can gather more feedback um, and I can come back to you. So I never need to say no because they came to that conclusion. It's more, I think, a bit of coaching them as well to shape their thinking in the way that you'd like to work in the outcome-driven world. This is my favorite organized ideation. Um, I don't like spending time in opinion battles uh, because I believe that opinion battles are generally when you have different uh, objectives, different goals, and you just argue over things. It's a battle. But when you have the same goals, then it's really effective. Like three weeks ago, like even like last week, we had a session where here is the objective and then each team member came representative from customer operations, sales. They brought their insights and they came up with suggestions. And it was one of the great sessions that I really like seeing and everyone was encouraged to kind of come up with solutions as well. Um, so as I mentioned, our advisors, we have our relationship managers. Um, and when I first joined and I went, I said I'll talk to advisors and I got a big, big no. Uh, and I talked to directors, different directors, and they said no, you need to go and talk to operations, customer teams. They know customers, you talk to them. Uh, I talked to them, uh, but I said I need to talk to customers because they know that's us better, right? At the end of the day. No, it didn't work. <laughs> and the organization was not really used to this culture, and I think there was a bit of history. Uh, problems there as well, maybe I wasn't aware of it, but so I'm not encouraging you to do that, but I made, uh, I scoped things really, really small for this, uh, just knowing that things might fail and things will probably fail. Um, and we went live with a really small and a new product with this approach. <laughs> and the end result was not surprising. Um, the feedback was really bad. Everyone was surprised, apart from me. <laughs> the customer teams, how we know them, how can this happen? So after that, actually, I said, I need to really talk to them. I need to understand why that failed because you all know them. So how can we make that make sure that we are doing the right thing? Uh, so I get that permission in the end, and I started kind of talking to people. Uh, we uh, didn't have user research at that time. Then we released something else, a second version, and it was successful. So as I mentioned in my uh, previous slides, it's of course inputs are really important. But if you especially have external or even internal, of course, if you have internal customers, talk to the people in your building as well, test it. But it's, I think, more around like, can you really get that insight from these external people? It's really, really important. It really changes. We still do internal testing um, from even though we have design sprints. 
For example, we have version A and version B, and version A is generally chosen by internal, and version B is chosen by customers. We go out live with version B. Um, it happens, I think we are a bit biased as well by product, so it's just trusting your customers, I think is more important. So just to recap, they do your research data, always has a better idea, um, gather your evidence, and it's qualitative and quantitative. Quantitative will give you what, how, and when, but qualitative data will give you the story behind it, the why, so it's really important. Um, so involve relevant people as well, because it's everyone has different backgrounds and different insights, so it's really useful to get that insight from different parts of the business when you're making these decisions. And assumptions are not that if you're aware of them, if you're not, they're even of all mistakes. And so just if you have uh, assumptions, testing them will validate it and it will be a learning even if it's a fail. fail. So the second part is, so understanding the business and customer side was quite a bit, uh, kind of like a bit of a process. The people side, however, is the opposite. It's more uh, related to psychology. If you like psychology, I like it. Uh, and I think one of the biggest differences between uh, software engineering and product management was the people side. I really enjoy it, but it's also sometimes you need to decode some of the stuff. Um, and when we look at success of products, like here you can see all of them, Spotify, Airbnb, Uber, uh, Facebook, um, most of these products actually have happy teams. It's not the other way around. So happy teams create uh, success products. When I talk to all the friends working there, they're really happy, they really have that vision, they work for the same goal, um, and they create these success products. So, so just having direction doesn't really help, and you might be working in teams where there might be unhappy people, and you might be one of them at some, some points. Um, so it's really important to understand the underlying reason for that behavior. Uh, this really helped me. This is a bit psychology side, if you like that. And um, this, uh, this is applicable to any human being. So it's to you, to me, to your relationships, people you're working with, your customers. So it's really quite a, a uh, needs a way to understand it. So for example, you're here today, thanks for coming. You're not in a pub with your friends. Uh, you might really like being part of that community. So it might be a your pleasure to be part of a product school. Um, or you might have someone at home, I don't know, mother-in-law, so you're avoiding that pain and coming here instead. Or you might be changing your job, or you might be kind of like seeking hope to uh, find something that will be useful for you, hopefully. And same as fear, uh, acceptance, and rejection. So these three, um, brain works in a way to avoid these negative feelings, negative things, because it's protective. And rejection, pain, and fear, they're really, really powerful in the internal triggers. Uh, these, the rest are uh, less powerful than the others. And when you have these, actually, uh, especially, for example, if you think of the products, or let's say you're waiting for your train today, things are sort of late, you just look at your phone, your favorite app, and they use that, this as well. So you're there seeking pleasure, you open your Instagram, watch cat videos, you're happy. So they use that as well. So it's kind of like one of the fundamental things uh, products use. Um, so you can use the same thing for the people you're working with without telling them. Um, so I had the, uh, when I first started, I was working with sales and I couldn't work with sales at first because they weren't really responsive. They were coming to me saying, uh, by, Essen, by the way, I promised this feature. Can you please have that next week? Okay, fine. Can we talk about this? <laughs> Um, after a while, I started kind of, there's a down the line problem and I'm not aware of it, so can I spend a bit more time to understand their world? I started catching up with them weekly to understand their kind of world and what's going on there. And I understood that, um, I didn't know that time, they don't get salaries, but they get their bonuses through the transactions that were made by their advisors. And Choice was a year-old product, and advisors are not willing to advise on products that are really new, so because they don't have track of record. And they are having that pain because they can't earn money. So they were ha having that painful, and you start showing empathy to them as well. Um, so what I've done that time is, uh, as they see uh, customers, like potential customers every single day, I ask them whether they can provide me the feedback so that I can help them more better and they can make more sales. I've created a super, tra super like basic Trello board for them, integrated with Slack. 
and I show them, can you, is, would that be useful for you? Can you add up to your session just like one liner if you hear something? And they said, okay, let's try. There were 60 people. And they started putting into that. And that, in that Slack integration, what helped was um, it was going through like once you move things. And so if you're using Slack, it's really uh, interactive. You can see the outcome, the results. If you add a comment, it's posted. So actually, they were able, even if they weren't in the office with a the client, they were able to check the status of things. After six months, they invited me to their team meetings and said, actually, 90% of the things you read, we raised were addressed. And it wasn't just fixing everything that they raised or doing something with that. It's more around that managing expectation. If there is just one um, feedback raised by them, by, by one advisor, I was also sharing the result with them saying, well, actually, the, I, we haven't received any feedback about this. We'll keep this and then uh, we'll revisit it later if you receive more feedback. So. They started trusting the process. They were also involved in the uh, sprint reviews and uh, retrospectives as well. And now they're actually one of the best people I'm working with. They have great insights. So uh, it's just really understanding, I think, the reason. So you have a change. So that's actually I just touched on. And it has a formula. Um, in order to change behavior, whether it's you or someone else, in the example I've given, in terms of motivation, ability, and trigger. So the triggers are the ones I just mentioned. The internal triggers are really powerful. The motivation in that example was actually they were a bit less motivated, but it's important to get them motivated. Um, and that's when I said, I can help you to sell more products if I get feedback. And they were a bit more motivated to, of course, earn more money, sell more products. The ability part is really important as well because even though you have motivation and trigger, if I ask them to use, can you use Jira, can you use Clubhouse, something that they wouldn't be able to use, still they wouldn't be able to make that change. So I, I try Trello with them, it works well, um, they find it easy to use, but it's just, I think for, for us, it's in turn, in making changes easier for them so that you can actually see the outcome of it as well. Um, so just a recap, I touched on most of these things. Um, so knowing all of this, actually, uh, if you'd like to adapt to team dynamics, you might be in a new team or the same team, but there might be uh, problems in the team as well. Understanding that underlying pain and finding the uh, way that would work for both sides would be the best thing because um, I have sometimes tendency, I, I like helping people, so it's not about people pleasing, it's more finding the way between, is, would that work for me, would that work for you? Um, and another thing which I really, I think it's really important is having that trust and reliability in the relationships and what I think is open communication and visibility gives that. So if uh, I didn't give them the access to all the systems, if they were coming to uh, sprint reviews, retrospective, if they didn't know it was the first comment I got from them was it's a black box and then after six months they didn't do that time meetings and they said we can catch up monthly once a week, we know what you're doing. Um, so it's just really, I think, visibility gives key, and I receive lots of comments from product managers as well. How, like, can, do we need to share everything? Because there are bad things happening as well, so it's not always <laughs> like great, as you might know. Um, personally, I'm choosing to share everything um, because I think it helps me. It's not always like blue skies, and it's good to kind of give that visibility to people. But it's a personal preference as well. You might be having conflicted situations, um, and again, I, I've done these uh, before, and the product manager work, we are maybe a bit passionate about product, and sometimes you get emotional over products. For you, if you get emotional, I think remembering the shared goals, because you're here, you're there for a reason, and everyone is working for the product to be successful. Your performance is measured by product success. So once you remember the uh, outcomes, the objectives you're working towards, it's easier to uh, solve that conflict. Same if you're fine, you can remind that actually we are here for the same reason, can we find another way to overcome this or find another solution. This is really only obvious, but sometimes we have these filters uh, when we don't agree with someone over and over again, like most of the time. Um, still respecting people's opinion and sometimes people say really important things and we miss that because of these filters. We don't have to agree to respect um, all the people we're working with. So key takeaways, um, understanding the business strategy is really key to set your objectives and uh, your customer objectives, especially linked with one KPI. Uh, one KPI I've seen so far from experience is quite enough to understand whether it's successful or not. And also you need people, you need to bring those on the journey to make change and to have success products. 
So there are a few references. So uh, the things I've talked about are a kind of combination of all the things I learned from, especially these people, and I changed a bit. <laughs> Um, so Roman Pichter, maybe you know that Roman Pichter is great at product strategy and roadmap. He has books and really good tools uh, and, like, and blog posts as well. Teresa Torres is great at product discovery. Her uh, videos are amazing and uh, blogs are really like uh, her talks about product discovery. And if you're interested in product psychology, I touched on the really small parts. Nirayal is really good at his book. Hoot is really, I can recommend that as well.